Hi everyone, welcome to 5 Quote Shakespeare Hamlet Theme Analysis. In this series we look at a total of 14 different themes and in this one we'll look at appearance versus reality, projection, we see what we want to see. What I do in each video is first identify important aspects of the theme and apply it to the play. And then we dig deeply into the text and pull out several quotes that prove the connection. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe. And if you make a donation, you'll get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. In my previous video on appearance versus reality and manipulation, we talked a bit about how important the theme of appearance versus reality is to literature. I mean, in, in our children's literature, for example, we love to be deceived and then we love to be undeceived. A child must learn that appearances are not always reality. Um, we're all familiar with these kinds of things. And it doesn't end in childhood, of course. Uh, one of the definitions of tragedy or a drama, perhaps, is, is something to do with appearance versus reality. There's something that we are wrong about, okay? And, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's instructive and it's fun uh, to, to be undeceived and to be, uh, to, to be shown to be pleasantly surprised at, the, at our mistakes. So we never stop learning. Uh, real life is difficult. What is true? What should I believe? How do I know my beliefs are true? Who and what do I trust? How do I know what is trustworthy? How shall I live given that falsehood, misapprehension, simple error exist, and that I also participate in this falseness? Uh, Pride and Prejudice is a, is a good example of that. She completely misjudges somebody, and it's great dramatic irony throughout the whole story to know that she's he's really the one. Do you see? We love this kind of stuff. Well, why do we love it? I think we love it because it's part of it's 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 part of life. It's, we, we, we actually do go through these. It's a rehearsal. Uncertainty is a fundamental uh, part of human experience. Appearance versus reality is one of the most common themes in all of storytelling because it presents us with possible answers, methods, and models for correct action, do you see? Um, we should be learning something. It's not that, you know, story shouldn't be wagging a finger at us, but through the process of, of, of storytelling, we, uh, we, we internalize some of these uh, possible solutions and, and, uh, and understandings of ourselves. So in Shakespeare, I've argued, uh, Shakespeare explores appearance versus reality in all of his plays. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous video, please prove me wrong if you, can find a, if you can find one of his plays that doesn't contain the theme of appearance versus reality, either as a central theme or simply an incidental theme. I think it's probably there in all of them. So as I said in my last video, I looked at manipulation, the lies of others, the deceptions, the gaslighting, the Machiavellian uh, uh, kind of appearance versus reality. And this one, we're going to look at self-deceptions, wishful things thinking, bias, prejudice, and, and that, that, that all stand by we see what we expect to see or we see what we want to see. Projection is a real thing. It's a psychological thing. You can look it up. Projection, confirmation bias you might be familiar with. Wishful thinking, of course. And wishful seeing is actually something I, I discovered in my, in my researches, which I guess basically just means we see what we expect to see. We see what we want to see. Um, we're all familiar with this. If you've had your first girlfriend or boyfriend, then you are familiar with this feeling as you should be. I am 100% sure you are absolutely perfect. Now, of course, they're projecting what they want to see into the other person. They don't even know each other yet. They've seen each other for a total of 90 minutes. So they know nothing about each other, but they're projecting into each other what they want to see. Uh, here it is again in Harry Potter, the mirror of Erised. And Erised, by the way, is desire spelled backwards. So it's exactly that. He's projecting in, into this mirror, not what really is, but what he wants to see. And in the, in the Harry Potter book, we've got this quote as well. I show not your face, but your heart's desire. So yes, it's a major, major part of the human experience. We do it all the time. And part of growing up is to learn how not to do that anymore. So in this play, in Hamlet, most characters in some way have a false impression of reality. That's what we're talking about, appearance versus reality. And perhaps that false impression of reality, as I suggested, is really a definition of tragedy, and drama and even perhaps comedy we can consider pride and prejudice those kinds of romance stories they end in marriage they end happily but they depend on this these false impressions they they they, they depend on appearance versus reality so all of these characters project onto others what they themselves contain in themselves do you see the, if he's corrupt he sees corruption in the world that's what we're going to talk about interestingly not claudius he's too clever for all that nonsense but everyone else in this play is guilty of some form of projection Projection. And of course, the most, most pathological projector is Hamlet. 
Hamlet, of course, has many personality disorders. He suffers anxiety and depression. He's a Puritan, which causes some psychological uh, uh, tension, tremendous tension. Uh, and, of course, he's under tremendous stress due to simply the events that are happening. His father died, murdered by his uncle, and his mother marries the uncle. So there, there's, there's a cause for distress as well. And all of that distorts his sense of reality. Uh, he is, he's, he's, he's guilty of black and white thinking, which is incredibly unhealthy. And this black and white thinking causes causes him to unrealistically project his preconceived notions onto the world. The world is either black or white, here's the white, here's the black, here's the white, here's the black. Not healthy at all. People are, are, are either saints or sinners in his mind. They're either paragons of virtue or exemplars of vice and corruption. Now, the most obvious example, of course, is his idealiz uh, 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 idealization of his father. Daddy is a god and his demonization of his uncle, his uncle and then eventually his mother and Ophelia and everybody else. Uh, his uncle is a brutish goat. So here's here's the quote from um, early early in the play in Act One, Scene Two. So excellent a king that there that uh, was to this Hyperion to a satyr so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven, visit her face too roughly. That's from his uh, uh, his soliloquy, of course. He compares his father to the sun god Hyperion, and he compares. Uh, um, his uncle to a satyr, which is a half goat, half man, which is an earthy uh, creature, which we're going to look at today. So these illusions, this hyperbole, my father blocked the winds from the face of my mother. So there, that hyperbole, that's an example of that distorted, exaggerated, idealized image of his father. It's the father that he wants to see, do you see? Uh, and that's, 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 Probably that probably pre-existed the opening of the play, so it has nothing to do with the father's murder. I don't think. I think Hamlet is very much a boy who hasn't grown up at all. Uh, he sees his father as a god, which we do when we're kids, rightly so, I suppose. Our parents are gods because what do we know? We're five years old. Uh, but it's not healthy to keep that image alive. It's a failure to escape childhood. That sense of awe still possesses Hamlet uh, and 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 holds him back. Um, I mean, famously, psych psychologists since Jung, I think, or maybe even before, you know, the ancient Greek myths and stories probably told us this. In order to become ourselves, we have to symbolically at least kill our parents uh, um, so that we can we can become who we are. In Harry Potter, we see that as well. Dumbledore willingly. Dumbledore and Harry. Dumbledore is the father figure for Harry. And Dumbledore willingly leaves, do you see? He actually says, please, please, Snape, kill me so that Harry can become who he's supposed to be. Okay, let's look a little bit more closely at, uh, at Hamlet's puritanical tendencies. There's nothing wrong, of course, with having a religious, spiritual, moral ideals that we try to live up to, but uh, it becomes a problem when you are so fanatical in that pursuit of this kind of glassy, uh, cold, icy perfection that you forget that you've got a body. You forget that you actually live on earth. And, and what happens with Hamlet as a Puritan is that he, he refuses to accept the lower half of what it means to be a human. And he, he insists on living up here and that causes him a kind of schizophrenic crack up. I'm going to talk about this again in my next video. I'm going to do a whole video on it because it's really, really important to Hamlet. And it's a very interesting topic too. Um, so the ancient Greeks, you might be familiar with the god Apollo. He's the sun god, Phoebus Apollo and uh, Dionysus Bacchus, of course, he's the god of wine and god of revels, and these two images capture it perfectly. That's, that's, that's a, a personification of our nobler energies, okay? It looks high, it looks, it looks skyward, it looks to all of the good and noble qualities in us, and the god Dionysus is portrayed in Greek mythology in two aspects. One, the young, vital, physical, earthy element, Revels. There's nothing wrong with fun. There's nothing wrong with being alive. The, the sexual energies are important. The lower energies are very important. Without those, we don't get humans. We don't get the animal side of what it is to be human, and there's nothing wrong with it. However, in this image, we also see the downside of the Dionysian, which could be, uh, um, and which is in certain cases, uh, a dissolute and and uh, and corrupt and ultimately destructive do you see so it's it's a trick it, it's a problem with humanity we've been wrestling this forever uh these two energies these two at the apollonian and the dionysian powers energies attitudes and attention where do you put your attention if someone is purely involved in this world they're doing nothing but drinking and partying every single night or weekend you got a problem and if you got a guy that wants to live up here like hamlet he insists on all ooh, all of these these gross younger 
mere mortals, do you see? Then you've got another problem in the opposite direction. And, and again, come back to my next video. I, I'm going to do a really deep analysis into this. So, Hamlet, <clears throat> these spiritual intellectual pursuits are in sharp, uh, in combat with the bodily and material energies that, that, of course, Hamlet as a human has. Hamlet's priggishness, his puritanical nature, causes him to reject what he sees as the corrupt lower energies in favor of the nobler, purer, higher energies, do you see? And corruption, the, one of the older meanings of corruption is literally to decay. And our body, in that sense, our body is corrupt because it does decay. The spirit doesn't decay, do you see? W.B. Yeats tried to get up there into the spiritual world, and he, he went to the city of Byzantium, his fantasy realm of art, do you see? But even W.B. Yeats realize that you can't stay there. Uh, so was, this is a good question too, was Hamlet's disgust present before he believed his mother committed adultery? Because one of his biggest problems is that he, he imagines his mother and Claudius having sex and he it's bestial, it's animal, it's depicted in the crudest terms, and he can't stand it. And that leads to him demonizing uh, and projecting this disgust onto uh, Claudius, Gertrude, and Ophelia. Now, did he have this kind of hatred of women's sexuality in particular before he realized that his mother was was this awful person, potentially awful person, that she's complex, and I've talked about her complexity before, and we'll talk about it again today. Uh, but yeah, if this disgust in, in female sexuality in particular, and, and all sexuality generally, uh, was, it, was it there before he, he saw that his mother was doing something that, that uh, really was objectionable? Anyway, so we see the pathology here. He can't stand the idea of his mother being a sexual creature. When he's railing at her in Act uh, 3, Scene 4, he says, nay, but to live. He can't, it's disbelief. How can we live, is what he's saying, in the rank sweat of an ensemed bed, stewed in corruption, honeying and making love over the nasty pigsty, do you see? I mean, that, that's pathological. He's really, he's too intently examining his mother's sex life with his uncle. Yikes, it's a pathological disgust, and it's an adolescent demand for an asexual mom. DC and is projected onto Claudius and Gertrude and later on he projects that onto all women and that's where we get the famous misogyny uh, 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 um, criticism of Hamlet. Was he really a misogynist or was he just reacting? He's projecting onto Ophelia uh, this disgust for his mom which may or may not be justified. That's, that's, the dis that's the difficulty of it. So Hamlet, the veneration and idealization of the high and an absolute disgust for the low. Okay, so let's go back to his uh, idealization of his, of his father. In that same bedroom scene where he's railing at his mother, he, he shows her a picture of the, of the two, of, of her, two pre, her, her two husbands, and he says, See what a grace was seated on this brow, Hyperion's curls, the front of Jove himself, that's Zeus, the sky god. And I, like Mars, the god of war, to threaten and command, a station like the herald Mercury, new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill, a combination and a form indeed where every god did seem to set his seal and give the world assurance of a man. I mean, that's, that's pretty over-the-top hyperbole. Personification of, of, of uh, all of these gods are personifications of, of the nobler qualities. Interestingly, though, uh, Mars, of course, is the god of war uh, to threaten and command. I, I think I've argued and I will argue that uh, Hamlet's father was a, was a bully. Uh, he, he dominated his, his son and maybe his wife, too. Maybe that's why Gertrude left you know, left him for Claudius. Who knows? Uh, we don't know. So is he a bully? In which case, that would be more projection. Hamlet would rather not see that part of the father and project onto the father all of these other good, noble qualities, do you see? So we're not quite sure. Um, so look here Look here upon this picture. That's from, the, that's from Act 3, Scene 4. Now, this is interesting, too. Pictures of uh, and a dead father or an absent father, a divorced father or mother. The distant parent, do you see, is a perfect... Uh, 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 um, is 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 ripe for projection. A frozen image or a dead parent is a perfect vessel for projections. It can't be proved wrong. So so conveniently, the the father or the parent is 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 out of the picture, and they can't through their daily faults, revealing of faults, they can't prove uh, uh, the projector wrong. Do you see?
Uh, so in contrast to this heavenly imagery, Claudius, of course, is described as earthy, base, corrupt, part of nature, which decays in a Paul's Hamlet. Uh, and so that's, that's this mind-body disconnect, and that's what causes him this kind of schizophrenic crack-up. As an idealist to Puritan, Hamlet is uncomfortable in the earthy realm. He prefers the unattainable spiritual perfection, as we just talked about. So here he is describing uh, Claudius in exact opposite terms. There's the heaven perfect heaven. Heaven is distant, by the way. As I said, it's perfect. It's ripe. Heaven is ripe for projections because everything up there is perfect. If you got to look at the real world, you see that flesh corrupts, do you see? Always. The way of all flesh is corruption. So he says of Claudius, he says, look at, look you now what follows. Here is your new husband, like a mildewed ear of corn, blasting his wholesome brother. So he imagines... Claudius has this decaying, rotten, infested ear of corn that is infecting the, the, the pure, heavenly ear of corn beside the corrupt ear of corn. There, there's, oh, it, it's this, he, he's, there's a disgust here for everything of the earth. This yucky, earthbound, organic matter is just ew, gross. I don't like it. Now, again, why do we love Hamlet so much? It's one of the most famous plays, if not the most famous play, in all of, of, of Western uh, literature because we agree with them. At one level, we agree with this. We, like decaying flesh, you see... Your loved ones, your dog dies, your goldfish dies. We, we don't. We rail against that. It's that shaking of the fist at the heavens for our human plight. So that's why we have this sympathy for Hamlet. However, we have to live in the real world. Okay, it just goes from bad to worse. We all project, of course, as I've suggested, but we don't all slip into a state of psychosis, which is what Shakespeare suggests is happening uh, towards the end of this bedroom scene. Um, the, he sees the ghost again, but but Gertrude doesn't see the ghost, which suggests that it's a projection of his his, uh, his uh, of insanity, of, of his psychotic uh, mental state. Now, at the beginning of the play, the ghost is not that. At the beginning of the play, the ghost of the father is not a projection. Other characters see it besides Hamlet. The ghost, at the beginning, beginning of the play is used to create atmosphere and of course it provides the inciting incident of the revenge plot without the ghost coming back and say you know avenge me there is no revenge play i talk about that in another video the uh, the revenge plot as the aspects of the revenge plot quite interesting actually uh, later however as i said shakespeare changes the function of the ghost it's, he's changed. Why not have Gertrude see the ghost? Shakespeare wants to imply that things are getting worse for Hamlet. He's, he's slipping into a, a psychotic state. Gertrude can't see the ghost, suggesting that, like Banquo's ghost in Macbeth, the ghost is a projection of Hamlet's overwrought mind. Uh, it, it, it's, it's exactly the same as Banquo's ghost in Macbeth, where Macbeth sees you know, Banquo, who's not there. Nobody else can see it. So here's here's Hamlet. Hamlet says to this ghost in terror. Hamlet's in absolute terror. There's that sense of awe, of course, confronted with the father, that boy who hasn't grown up yet. So here the father comes back again in his mind, and Hamlet says, "Do not come, do not come, your tardy son to chide. Don't come to 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 get angry with your late, your delaying." Son, that lapsed in time and passion lets go by the important acting of your dread command. Yes, I know I haven't done what you've told me to do yet, Dad, but please, please, just give me a break, give me a break, give me a break. So there's that overawed father. It, it's a projection of Hamlet's shame and fear of judgment. I'm not the man my father wants me to be. He's projecting that and he's seeing the ghost in his mind's eye, do you see? Uh, very, very, very sad. Um, Gertrude, of, here's, here's our evidence that he is in a psychotic state. Gertrude says, alas, how is it with you? You do bend your eye on a vacancy. There's nothing there, son. And with the incorporeal air do hold discourse. Forth at your eyes, your spirits widely, wildly peep. So that, that intensifies the sense of compassion and, and, and that we feel for Hamlet and his, his extreme dis distress. Um, she says again at the end, she says, this is a very coinage of your brain in that metaphor. You are just making this, you are coining uh, uh, this image out of your brain. This bodiless creation, ecstasy, insanity is very cunning. And so madness is very, very good at creating these uh, projections in us. So she basically calls them crazy, <laughs> you know, which, which we don't really need confirmation of. But there it is. Um, it's quite sad. Okay, and it gets sadder. 
Sad, too, is Hamlet's inability to have fun. He is certainly a wet blanket. I think all Puritans are, by definition, a wet blanket. Uh, and that cuts him off from humanity, and that isolates him even more. Uh, and, and Shakespeare uh, expla- explored this in um, Twelfth Night as well. Malvolio is a, is a, is a prig of the highest order, uh, but we have tremendous sympathy for him because he is so cut off from him from a huge part of himself because he, he's this, his arrogance makes him try to live up in this Apollonian realm. So Hamlet judges his entire culture based on his own ideal standards of proper proper behavior. Early in the play, Shakespeare wants to establish the fact that he's a no-fun guy. He's a no-fun guy. He's talking to Horatio, and Hamlet complains that we're all a bunch of drunkards. We're all party. We're party animals here. Hamlet says, the king doth wake tonight and, and takes his rouse, because they heard the the, uh, uh, the cannons shot, and Horatio wonders what it is, and, and Hamlet says that that's a signal that the party's about to start. Um, so the king doth wake tonight and takes his rouse, keeps wa- uh, wassail, and the swaggering up, up spring reels. So he's th- everyone's starting to dance and have a good time now. And Horatio says, is this a custom? You're always doing this drinking and partying at night? And Hamlet laments the fact that that's the case. He says, aye, it is the case. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honorable when you dis regard the custom and, and in the breach than in the observance. If you observe the custom of the partying, then you are not honorable. If you forego the partying, then you are honorable, which is him, do you see? So there's a priggishness about that. A priggish Puritan sees dissolution rather than simple happiness. Now, it might be true. It, uh, we don't quite know. Is, is Hamlet correct in this? Remember the fact that the hero is the one that everybody hates because the hero sets himself or herself apart and says, no, we're doing it wrong. That's the heroic story. That's the hero story. The story is the one that is that that looks at society and says it's a wasteland in whatever respect it's a wasteland and I'm the one chosen to be separate and to go out and fix it instead of just living in in that moment so is he that kind of character is is it correct that Claudius is kind of, is a bore and that uh, uh, Denmark is dissolute maybe I, I suspect not though I think I think Shakespeare is using Hamlet as a kind of uh, a new Malvolio uh, an, an even more sympathetic Malvolio um, so that kind of that kind of priggishness and puritanism, uh, of course, is reflected onto Ophelia brutally. Hamlet projects onto Ophelia what he perceives to be Gertrude's crimes. Now, this is my argument as well. I've touched on this already. Uh, what came first, Gertrude's crimes or Hamlet's misogyny? Was Hamlet simply a misogynist at the beginning? He hated women and he hated his, his he hated his own sexuality and therefore hated women's sexuality, and he blamed women the, for for the sins of Eve. Uh, and it very there is tons of evidence for this. But if he was poi- if he was had if he th- there's lots of evidence too that that he and uh, Ophelia did have sex in the play, and I'm going to prove that later on, or before the play opened rather, uh, and maybe that was a healthy relationship. Maybe he had a healthy relationship with sexuality and Ophelia, and then he sees what his mother got up to with Claudius and the and the taking off of the of the husband so quickly, uh, and that soured his his opinion of women. That's a possibility as well. I really don't know which way to go on that. So he, of course, he's ranting at, at uh, mercilessly at Ophelia here. He says, I have heard of your paintings too well enough. God hath given women, you specifically, but women generally, one face and you make yourselves and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, you tease us, you're seductive and you lisp. You make your, your licentiousness your ignorance. You pretend that your your, your crude seductions uh, are, are, are simply your innocence. So there's a real hatred of women here. But again, I, I, I would argue that, that it may come from his projection of, of, his, of his rightful criticisms of his mother's behavior onto women generally. But e- even if that's the case, then that's not fair because poor Ophelia is certainly does not deserve this. But when he's yelling at her like this, he's not talking to Ophelia. He's not talking to Ophelia. He's talking to his mother. That's what projection is. The projection is that. Um, there was a wonderful uh, Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath had a really tortured relationship. And uh, Sylvia Plath was a bit crazy. And Ted Hughes was, you know, he was a pretty tough guy. We would call him toxically masculine today, but I don't think that's fair. Uh, he was a very sensitive guy. Uh, and Sylvia Plath was filled with hatred and anger towards Ted Hughes. And he said in one of his poems, he said, you, you weren't shooting at me. You were shooting at your father but you hit me do you see the ghost of sylvia plath's father 
got in the way, uh, and that's projection, and I, that may be what's going on here with Hamlet. It's really, really, really interesting. Uh, here, of course, he, he, he's an inexperienced adolescent boy, uh, completely disgusted by the notion that his mother could be a sexual creature at all, an animalistic creature, which we all are. He hates it. So he says, you cannot call it love, mother, for at your age, the heyday in the blood is tame. You shouldn't have any sexual feelings at your age. And look at the face of her. Um, Penny Dowland, I think her name is. Wonderful, wonderful actor. She does, a, she does the best job of Gertrude ever. So much complexity. She packs into a really difficult character because Gertrude doesn't have a lot of lines. We really don't know. But she does a wonderful job. And look at here she's saying dude 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 Claudius was so much a better lover than your father that's ooh. I mean maybe that's the case do you see what would you know about it boy poor Hamlet he's such a such a wreck okay uh, and yeah so in, in a lesser you know not quite as drastic way he, he does idealize Horatio too Hamlet as the hero in this revenge play is absolutely isolated partly for for the reasons we just mentioned, he's a prig, and he, he separates himself from society. So that's his, that's on him. However, um, I, I, the circumstances are horrible. He's got a mother he can't trust. He's got an uncle who murdered his father. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, his old buddies he can't trust. Everyone in the court is corrupt. Ophelia refuses access to him because her father told him to, so he's hurt by that. Re she returns his letter, so he's hurt by that, partly for his own, because of his own uh, a cruelty as well, so that's complicated. But he's completely isolated, so he needs desperately to believe in someone. The world is a wasteland. Go back to watch my other videos. The wasteland is a very important theme in this play. The world is a wasteland. There's nobody he can trust, so he needs somebody. And so his Samwise, in Lord of the Rings, of course, he's the Samwise character. He's the Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger character, the one that supports the uh, the, the hero in his or her endeavors. Uh, so he desperately needs to see someone that he can trust. And so he idealizes Horatio. It's a projection of his image of a model man in contrast with his own weaknesses because he knows he's full of self-hate and he knows that he's, he's corrupt and, and miserable as well. Uh, but also the court's corruption. He sees everything around him and he says, my goodness, is there one person on this planet that is decent? Uh, in reality, uh, yeah, so that's his projection. But in reality, we really do hear little from Horatio. We really don't know. He plays the Samwise character, uh, Gamgee, Samwise, Gam, Sam, Gamgee. He plays that character perfectly. He just watches the hero. He just watches the hero. And very, very rarely does he comment uh, uh, on the hero. So we really don't know what he thinks, except in a few little cases, which I'm going to talk about. So here he says to Hamlet in, in Act 3, he says, Horatio, thou art even as just, as honorable a man as ever my conversation coped with all you. You're one of the most honorable people. You are the most honorable person I've ever met. Give me that man that is not passion slave, and I will wear him in my heart's core. I, in my heart of heart, as I do thee. So... Uh, it's the appearance of perfection. Now, nobody, as we've seen with the Romeo and Juliet illusion, nobody is perfect. Nobody is as perfect as we think they are. He's projecting into him what he wants to see. And this is really, really interesting. If you dig into the play and you try to find out what's going on in Horatio's mind, there are these moments, and this is one of them here. Uh, he says... Later, Horatio reveals his political side. Now, remember, what Hamlet hates is the, is the hypocrisy and corruption of the political court. All of them are courtiers, including his best high school buddies or childhood buddies, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're all a bunch of corrupt courtiers. Uh, Horatio reveals in a couple of places his 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 political shrewdness. So when Ophelia is seen ranting off, is heard about ranting off stage, Horatio wisely, and with sheer politics, cruel, brutal politics, he says, it were good that Ophelia were spoken with. We have to talk to Ophelia, not because we want to save her life, but we have to talk to her because she may strew dangerous conjectures and ill-breeding minds. She may make the court look bad, so we have to shut her up, is what he's saying. That's political. That's pure politics. Now, there's one instance, but at the very, very end of the play as well, uh, when, when, when Hamlet has died and he's talking to Fortinbras, he says the same kind of thing. He says, yeah, 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 let me talk. Let me reveal everything that happened so that nobody gets the wrong idea of what's going on here in Denmark. So he is a political mover. He's a politi 
political thinker. Uh, is that the reality? He's a political fiend like everybody else. Hamlet doesn't want to see that, of course. He wants desperately to see uh, what what he sees in Horatio, which is the great guy. You're not like the rest of us, are you? Please say no, is what he's saying here. Very, very interesting. Now, speaking of political fiends, I'm going to talk about Claudius because he's such a great contrast to all of these other projectors. He's too smart for projection. Claudius is much too cunning and clear-headed to succumb to the tricks and nonsense of projections. He's not fooled at all. He's a, he's, a, he's a political shaker and a mover. He's not fooled by appearances. He has a very firm grasp of reality in, other, in order to control it. You have to. If you, if you are that kind of political-minded person, you have to understand reality for what it is and use it to your advantage. In fact, he even lies about projecting. He, he almost reveals an understanding of projection, and he uses it. Uh, he lies about it to manipulate Gertrude. Here he says, uh, in Act 4, he says, But so much was our love, we would not understand what was most fit to deal with the mad Hamlet. So he's, he's kind of kicking himself here and saying, we, should, we, did, we haven't dealt with Hamlet properly. And I, I couldn't see, I was too blinded by my love for Hamlet uh, to, to actually take some more aggressive action to lock him up or send him away or whatever it was. So that's a lie. He's lying to Gertrude here to stay on her good side. He's not the kind of man who lets love get in the way of anything. He's, he, his love for Hamlet wouldn't forbid him from doing anything. Uh, you could also argue here that, uh, and the way that this movie acts it and portrays it, he's actually saying, too much was my love for you, Gertrude, uh, that I couldn't see what was best for Hamlet. But even if that's the case, uh, then he, he, that's a lie too, of course, because that's all appearances, because he's not the kind of guy to let love get in the way of, of his political survival. Um, here's another example of that. Unlike Polonius, Claudius doesn't project his own corruption. He recognizes Hamlet's naivete. Now I'm going to talk about very soon, I'm going to talk about Polonius and how he, very simply, he's a corrupt guy and he lies He's an awful odious character, and so he's, he just projects that onto his own son. Of course my son is like that, because that's the way people are, right? Because that's what he has in his head. That's, that's one of the definitions of, of, of projection. Uh, uh, um, he doesn't do that. Claudius doesn't do that. He actually sees, he, he's able to see Hamlet's naivete. He doesn't take his own corruption and say, oh, Hamlet must be corrupt and trying to stab me in the back, because that's what people do, right? Because that's what I have in my head. But no, he sees Hamlet's naivete for what it is. And he says here to Laertes, he says, we can trick Hamlet easily with the foils, with the, with the, with the sword fighting, because Hamlet being remiss, he's careless about these things. He's too generous. He's most generous and free from all contriving. He won't check the foils. He won't check the, uh, the tips of the, of the, of the, the foils that we're going to use in the dagger. So he sees reality and he uses reality to his advantage. Now, Gertrude is much more complicated than that. It's kind of hard to pin down in what way she's projecting, if indeed it can be called projection at all, but she's certainly living in, in under some kind of illusions, obviously. Uh, she married uh, um, um, unless... Unless, if Gertrude is not a cunning Machiavel who plotted with Claudius, is she just naive? So let's assume for a moment that she's not a cunning Machiavel who actually wanted to kill her husband, uh, which obviously this this play depicts it as uh, not being the case. And I, I don't think it is the case, actually, but you could make that argument. Uh, well, if that's not the case, then sh she's an idiot. She She's naive. Or does she willfully turn a blind eye and prefer appearances over reality? So she knows if she suspects, a lot of people do this, we suspect that the truth is horrible, but we prefer not to see it. To maintain her status, does she project goodness onto Claudius, the goodness that she wants to see? I don't want to lose my position as queen. Claudius loves me, so yeah, he's, he's, he definitely didn't kill my husband, <laughs> do you see? So if she's going to go along with it, maybe we can. We we are humans are capable of lying to ourselves like that. Uh, uh, and and Hamlet in this bedroom scene, of course, dispels her of those illusions. If in, if indeed those are the illusions under which she was operating, uh, a bloody deed. So Gertrude says, "What bloody deed is this? When you killed uh, Polonius, what bloody deed was this?" She says, and Hamlet says, "A bloody deed, almost as bad, good mother, as kill a king and marry his brother." So that's a straight-up accusation uh, that, "Mom, you killed my dad. You killed your husband." Uh, now her reaction is really, really important, and the way that this uh, Penny Dowland and the director in this version, the 2009. Uh, 
version with David Tennant, uh, they chose to, to, to do it as if she's completely shocked. She had no idea that that's, and here's what, here's the face of her when she's actually saying, that's kill the king, what are you talking about? So this is where that she, it, it's been, her, her projected illusions are being dispelled in this particular scene. She saw only what she wanted to see up until this moment. And now Hamlet has pulled back the curtain and says, no, your husband is, is this, do you see? Did she suspect before? And she just, just willfully turned a blind eye. We don't quite know. Hamlet obviously clearly suspects his mother's guilty of murder. Of murder. Uh, is that appearance reality or is that really appearance? Now, in this movie version, here we see her. Now she's afraid. Uh, this is when he, when Hamlet leaves and he comes in after the end of the scene and this is where she first gets an inkling of what her husband, her new husband might have been, might be capable of and she really doesn't know how to respond. She loves him. She does love him, I believe, genuinely. But, but she, she, she's torn between going to him for comfort because her son is mad and she, he's, you know, accusing her of these horrible things. Or she doesn't, here's that face. Do I trust this guy? Is he indeed a murderer? She's, she's, she's a complete, she's a complete wreck. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's always tricky to talk about Gertrude, but always a lot of fun. Now here's, here's, here's a, more, a much, much simpler example of, project, of projection, which we all do really. So guilty or traumatized people project their anxieties onto the world, seeing appearance of catastrophe everywhere. People who have been traumatized in the past will tend to see these negative things and judge people badly, like a kicked puppy. If a puppy was abused, every human that the puppy sees, they shrink from that human. That's a kind of projection, do you see? So Gertrude says here, uh, um, aside, in an aside, to my sick soul, so th this is when she hears news of, uh, of Ophelia. Somebody reports news that Ophelia is having trouble, and then she, her, she's, she's got another traumatic shock to her system, even though she doesn't know what's going on. So this is that kind of, you know, kicked puppy kind of thing. So to my sick soul, as sin's true nature is, each toy, each little trifle of news seems a prologue to some great catastrophe, some great amiss, do you see? So that's a very, very, very simple example of projection but this stuff is a lot more interesting oh polonius polonius's projection is very simple as well polonius is corrupt of course and he is, he himself is an immoral kind of guy and he's therefore very cynical and a cynical person is always very suspicious if you're cynical you look at the world and you see the worst in everybody everybody and that's the kind of guy polonius is he projects that poisonous of soul onto everybody, uh, and especially Laertes, very most obviously Laertes and Hamlet. So to uh, about, I mean, good grief, I've talked about this before as well. It's actually horrible. He, he, he wants to spy on his son because he assumes his son is going to get up to horrible things. What truths does he expect to find uh, by spying about his son? So he says to Ronaldo the spy, he says, your bait of falsehood. So if you tell mischievous, malicious lies about my son, that's, a, that's some bait, and the person you're talking to will take that bait and give us a fish of truth about what my son is up to, do you see? Uh, and thus do we, by lying, by indirections, find truths out. By indirections, find directions out. And so, by my former lecture and advice, you'll find out the truths about my son. Well, what truths does he really expect to find out about his son? What? That he's a liar, that he's a gambler, that he, that he, does, that he goes to prostitutes. I mean, really, what is it that you expect to see in your son? What a horrible, horrible man. And But that's all coming from inside and the 1996 kenneth Branagh version portray th this version portrayed him polonius is more of a fool uh the 1996 version portrayed him much much more viciously cynical and when he's talking to ronaldo there's actually a prostitute in his room do you see and that that's a clear indication of what i just mentioned about he's projecting his own iniquities onto his dear son a liar sees lies everywhere a whoring a horror <laughs> A horrible person sees horrible people everywhere. And he says that he, he feels the same about Hamlet. So he, uh, he famously, of course, uh, uh, calls Hamlet's love uh, declarations to Ophelia, absolute bosh. Ophelia says, but father, Hamlet hath given countenance into his speech, my lord, with almost all of the holy vows to heaven. There's young love, there's potential young love that we saw in Romeo and Juliet as well. And in Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare uh, elevates that into something that is indeed holy. Uh, love is seen in a lot of Shakespeare plays. And the old notion of love is something divine, I think, is a lovely notion that we, I don't know if we've lost that in the modern world or not, but love is something divine, uh, an ideal to strive for. That's 
That's, that was part of Shakespeare's worldview uh, in its best form. Now, there is evidence, and I've argued already today, that, that perhaps Hamlet was lying here, perhaps that he was just using her. Um, most filmed versions that I've seen actually don't take that line. The most film versions actually do show their love as something that was genuine. But for someone like Claudius, for a corrupt soul like Claudius, no, any vows of heaven are simply lies to get into a to get a woman into bed. Do you see a young naive girl into bed? So Polonius says, "Ah, springs to catch woodcocks. Those are just traps to catch a stupid little bird like you, daughter. I do know when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows." So uh, a, a, a prodigal soul will lie, will say anything to a young innocent bird to get that bird into bed, do you see? There's a heartbreaking cynicism here. Uh, luckily, in Romeo and Juliet, uh, Juliet escapes that uh, trap. And uh, she's much, she's, compare, write an essay comparing Juliet with Ophelia. I, I've said that before, and I'll say it again. Juliet is the exact opposite. She's the tough-minded, uh, uh, young, young, tough, fiery spirit. And, and, and poor Ophelia is the exact opposite. And both women do exist. Both girls' types exist. And uh, Hamlet types exist as well. These kind of weak, overly sensitive men versus tough-minded Claudius's, do you see? Hamlet... Shakespeare's got the complete human, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's talk about Hamlet. Uh, Laertes. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they say, and Laertes, the apple, doesn't fall far from Polonius, the tree. Like his father, Laertes projects his own faults, his iniquities, and his own immorality onto Hamlet and Ophelia. Uh, now, at, at, just before the father comes in and starts yelling at Ophelia, Laertes basically does the same thing here and says to her, for Hamlet and his trifling and the trifling of his affections, of his favor, think of it as just a fashion, a toy in the blood. Okay, so that's basically the same thing that uh, Polonius ends up saying. Don't be, a, don't be a green girl. Don't be naive. He's lying to you for his own pleasures. Now, Laertes basically says that. That's what he's saying. But he, he, he's a bit more nuanced. And he says something that, that is actually true. He says, because Hamlet is subject to his birth status, his status as the prince. He's subject to that. He has to, he has to pay attention to that and not, not you. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself. So he can't choose whoever he wants to marry. So even if he does love you, he can't marry you. So you have to think of his affections as simply a toy in the blood. So there's cynicism here, but it's grounded in something uh, uh, um, uh, more real than simply uh, Polonius' absolute corrupt projection. Laertes might not be quite so corrupt. But Ophelia calls him, calls him out on this, and she draws attention to, the, to this projection, possible projection. She says, but good brother, do not, as some ungracious priests or ministers do, show me the steep and thorny and boring hard way to heaven as a Puritan, while you, like a puffed and reckless libertine, a playboy, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads and wrecks not his own advice. He doesn't listen to his own advice. So don't you send me on the thorny path to heaven while you have a lovely primrose roses path to fun, maybe in hell, and you don't listen to your own advice. So she's calling out his projections. Are you sure you're not projecting your own sinful desires onto me? And here in this particular movie, she digs into his, she was helping him pack, and she found condoms in his luggage. And she says, uh, you're going to do what you're accusing me of wanting to do, you hypocrite. So there's, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so take that as you will. I, I, I don't know. That qualifies it somewhat, that wisdom. But, but yeah, he's probably still projecting like uh, somewhat like Polonius. Uh, here's another example of that projection, uh, a simpler one to understand. I think Laertes needs a villain and projects onto the nearest logical target for his rage, Claudius. Uh, so, so at the end, at the very, towards the end of the play, Laertes comes back and his father's dead. Uh, and he needs, he, he's, he's filled with this irrational, blind subconscious force, desire for revenge. I got it. And somebody has to answer for the death of my father, especially because of the secretive way that he was, uh, 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 his body was disposed of. There's something wrong here. It must be the king, do you see? And so he projects on to the nearest lo logical target for his rage, Claudius. Now remember, all that's a scapegoat. He scapegoats. Oh, thou vile king, give me my father. He accuses him. And in this particular film version, he's got a gun and he holds a gun to, uh, to Claudius's head. 
so that's he's scapegoating. He's scapegoating Claudius for uh, the the pain he feels and the need desire for revenge that he has. He needs to find a villain, and so he finds a villain easily in Claudius. Now remember, all scapegoats are forms of projections. I'm not the one who's lazy. It's those kinds of people who are lazy. I'm not the one who's corrupt. It's those kinds of people who are corrupt. I'm not the one who's lascivious and licentious and a libertine. It's my sister who's that, do you see? Or it's Hamlet who's the ha Hamlet more accurately is that, do you see? Okay, so uh, poor o Ophelia certainly suffers from some kind of delusions. Let's see. Like all young lovers, of course, Romeo and Juliet included, Ophelia projects her notions of the ideal man onto her love interest, Hamlet. Um, and it, it, we should remind ourselves that these projections do contain a grain of truth. So she speaks very, very highly in exaggerated hyperbolic terms about Hamlet here. Um, and th there, there might be some truth in it. I think there probably is. So when she's, after the nunnery scene where he's railed at her and gone seemingly, uh, gone crazy, which I think he has, uh, although there's, you could argue that it's merely an antic disposition, but I think he's kind of lost lost it in that scene, in, in scene uh, act three, scene one. So she says, she collapses and she says, oh, what a noble mind is here or thrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eyes, tongue and sword, the expectancy and the rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion. So he was a perfect you know, dandy. He was. He had. He had great fashion looks, and the mold of form. So his body was was perfect. So it, it's it's a bit too much perf perfection. Uh, it's hyperbolic. Um, but again, that's what's to be expected when somebody loves somebody. Uh, now we have to prove then if that that might be false. That might be a projection. Uh, it, and, and I think this could be evidence for that. Uh, when she goes insane in this particular scene here, she, she's completely insane. She comes in and she's reciting poems and she's singing these songs. Uh, it's sexually charged. A lot of her, uh, what she says in, a, in a, this uh, crazy state, this psychotic state, reveals subconsciously reveals that they've probably had sex and that he might have uh, uh, lied to her. What it actually... It suggests that what Polonius feared was actually the case, do you see? In which case, then this is certainly a projection of her ideal man onto this guy that didn't deserve it, do you see? So Ophelia unconsciously reveals she and Hamlet have had sex. There's also evidence that Hamlet had been using her. I've heard it argued many, many times that Hamlet didn't love her at all. Uh, and the, 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 the best example, the best proof for that is the fact that uh, he never, never speaks of her. Um, even at the graveside, where he sees her dead body, it, as a narcissist, all he can think of, of of is himself and how I loved her more than you, Laertes. That's all he's trying to do in that entire scene. And as soon as he, as soon as he establishes the fact that I loved her more than you, Laertes, he can, doesn't talk about her at all. There's not a tear in his eye at the end of it. He doesn't. He's not left alone on stage with her. There's none of that. So yeah, you could argue that he didn't love her at all. He loved himself more than anything. Uh, so did he only appear sincere when he was sweet talking her? So was Polonius correct? Do you see? So here's 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 a quote from one of her, the songs that she sings. Young men will do it if they come to it. By cock they are to blame. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. Do you see? So that that's that's pretty damning. And that's that's a that's her adulation was mere projection. That's the question we have to ask. Uh, and remember, in a, in, a, in a subconscious state, in a dream state, as Freud discovered, oh no, Freud didn't discover it, Shakespeare discovered it, and the Greeks before him discovered it. We've, we've always known this, and our artists and our myths and our religions revealed this truth that in our subconscious, in our dreams, for example, and in these kinds of states, we reveal what's, what, what, what truths are. So she breaks down here when appearances, self-deceptions, projections, and illusions, when they give way to reality, when those appearances all give way to reality, uh, the defenses of the psyche are broken. That's what a, that's what a projection is. That's what a self-deception is. It's a defense. I don't want to know the truth. I don't want to know the truth. Think back to Gertrude. Gertrude doesn't want to know the truth about about Claudius, her husband. She doesn't want to know, she doesn't want to know, but then when it's revealed, the psyche can collapse, do you see? Uh, when, when they can't, when those defenses can't hold up to the, the overwhelming evidence, and that's what happens here. And I think that's that's part of the case. The In, in Ophelia's case, it was the father's death that triggered it, but it's, a, it's not just that. It's a buildup of all of these things uh, uh, going on in, in society, and Hamlet's problem was one of the big ones.
Horatio, uh, it, not much to say about Horatio, but there, there is something there. Horatio doesn't say much in praise of Hamlet at all, but his, his blind loyalty uh, reveals that he's perhaps projecting something onto, onto Hamlet. It's, it's a bit iffy, but I think, th I think there's a case to be made. Like Ophelia, Horatio's appraisal of Hamlet is suspiciously rosy. Is it projection? I think so. For example, he, he remains blindly loyal, offering only, only a hint of questioning rebuke when Hamlet has told him that, yeah, I killed my, I killed my two childhood friends. And how, how does Horatio respond? with disgust and, and anger. It's like, how could you, Hamlet? No, he just says, so, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern go to it, do they? That's, that's all he says. And then Hamlet, to this non-accusation, Hamlet comes back and he just says, why, man, they did make love to this employment. It's their own fault. Or they, they pursued this end. They are not near my conscience. I don't think about them at all. So that blind following, I think, uh, reveals that, that he, he does... His job, Horatio's job in this story, is is not as a real character. It's it's as a he, it's a functional character. He's he's the he's the bro. Fiction requires a good bromance. You know, there's you know uh, Ron Weasley and Harry Potter. There's there's you know Frodo and Sam. And the purpose of that bro is just to reflect certain characteristics onto the hero. And so we are, we, we, Hamlet, I've argued thousands of times, he's, he, he's a horrible guy. <laughs> I don't know if you'd want him as a friend, but he's incredibly relatable because we all understand his weaknesses. We all feel his frustrations and we all have tremendous sympathy for him. In other ways, he's a decent guy, maybe the only decent guy in Elsinore, in this wasteland, do you see? Because he is the chosen hero, but there's so many character flaws and he's so messed up that, uh, that, that, we have a hard time judging him. Uh, so the purpose of Horatio is to enhance the sympathies. At the same time, we're critical of Hamlet for all of his faults that we've been discussing. A good man, a seemingly good man like Horatio's appraisal, good appraisal of Hamlet, elevates our sympathies towards him and makes him a very, very real, real character. So at the end, of course, Horatio says, now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince, that famous line, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Now, that it's fairly neutral. Uh, you know, I would say that, I might not say, if, if there was a horror, like when Claudius dies, I would say, good night, king, flights of angels, sing thee to thy rest. I suppose, I don't know, would you, I don't know, I don't, how, how would, how, as monsters, when monsters die, do you spit on their grave? Or do you, as fellow human beings, you wish them, some kind of redemption somewhere. I really don't know. Only the good of the dead, even when they were living in the sea. Horatio doesn't necessarily speak well of Hamlet, but he, he behaves in a way that reveals that we should uh, take Horatio's behavior as a positive appraisal of Hamlet. So maybe projection. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, definitely projection here. At the simplest level, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are pretty simple characters. They're naive, unworldly gulls, and they see what they expect to see in Claudius. He's our king, and the king in the Elizabethan worldview, the great chain of being, the king was a linchpin to all happiness and peace and harmony and grace in the universe. Uh, and they see that. That's their, that's their image. That's what they were raised with. That's their worldview. And they project that onto Claudius. They see Claudius as a selfless king taking his responsibilities to people seriously. If the king gets killed, then, then the wasteland can emerge in, in the great chain of being in a, cos, in, a, in a cosmic view where the great chain of being is, is, uh, is what keeps everything together, do you see? Um, so in, in that sense, yeah, they, 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 they don't reveal anything more complex than that. They project onto him uh, what the worldview would have been back in those days. Most holy and religious fear it is to keep those many, many bodies safe. Everybody in the population of Denmark is being kept safe by you. And it is holy and religious fear to keep those bodies safe that live and feed upon your majesty, do you see? Um, so yeah, so in, in that level, then yeah, they're, they're projecting. However, uh, are Rosencrantz and Guildenstern corrupt, self-serving, hangers-on, willingly betraying Hamlet, their friend, for cash and prestige? If that's the way you want to look at it, there's not a lot of evidence for that because we don't. All we hear is, all we see is this kind of stunned, uh, uh, deer in the headlights kind of response to their all of a sudden importance uh, in the world, the prestige that they've been given. Uh, so, is this real, sincere reverence 
for the appearance of the divine role of the king? Maybe, and most versions of the play depict it as such, uh, I think. Uh, or is it, you, you could, you could you, a, a director could have these guys as plotters, as sinister as Polonius, do you see? And Claudius himself, perhaps. They see an opportunity for cash and prestige, so they go for it, and they're willingly stabbed their friend in the back. Perhaps, are they cynical and self-serving? Is this mere cynical self-serving flattery i don't know i suspect it's simply that they're projecting onto the king their notion of what a king is they got their simple-minded guys okay that was five quote shakespeare hamlet theme analysis appearance versus reality projection come back for my next video when we look at mind body dualism puritanism as we've talked about a little bit today uh, and don't forget if you found these videos useful please like and subscribe and pick up a copy of your pdfs if you need them thanks for watching